is out of that association that uh, she uh, tries to um, recapture moments of her childhood and uh, look back upon her visits to Bihar uh, and tries to analyze the present day kind of imbroglio in which Bihar happens to be in. Um, thirdly, that um, this, the, the film is, um, uh, I, I think I shouldn't say much about the form except that, uh, you know, it has a continuous voiceover because uh, most of the time she didn't have the money to sort of, you know, do the English dubbing for, for the dialogue. So she adopted a voiceover as a kind of an economical measure of, uh, uh, of narrating the whole thing. So you might find it a bit verbose, but it is uh, explication of, uh, of a scenario which, uh, and, uh, and to convey it to others who may not be familiar with it. You know. And um, fourthly, it's a, it's a kind of a historical um, account. It traces the history right from the ancient period uh, uh, basically trying to make a contrast, I suppose, um, uh, she having read uh, Arvind's book and uh, stuff, material, which I, of course, uh, passed on to her, uh, and derived those uh, sort of uh, stuff, and, uh, uh, and it's there. <laughs> and um, finally, uh, one other thing I wanted to say is that uh, this film was made in the context of the Haibaspur uh, massacre, which was during the Holi this year. Um, well, it's made in video format, VHS, 28 minutes duration. Um, it is available from the address given. Uh, I uh, I've brought this film particularly to show uh, it to people who are much more knowledgeable about Bihar than we find people in, 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 in Calcutta. Uh, and that is why we wanted this film to be shown to such people so that they could sort of, you know, uh, either sort of, you know, pass on by word of mouth um, its usefulness if they find it useful so that it, it can circulate. And secondly, uh, if anybody is interested in acquiring it as instructional material or for showing it anywhere, uh, you're welcome to write to the address and directly contact the maker and find out more about the, how to obtain the sense of the film. some of the happiest moments of my life. I have visited Madhupur, Gaya, Patna and events have taken me to the Bhojpur district and even up to Siwan. Yet, to my great dismay, my heart is filled with sorrow and pain after witnessing the stagnation, degeneration and indiscriminate violence in this province which is endowed by vast natural resources and huge mineral deposits. Do you remember our huge rambling house in Madhupur, Dad, where the Santal women would come to sell our overgrown gardens? You never taught us the difference between upper and lower castes, and we were happy in our ignorance. So many Bengalis like us had houses in Bihar those days, where vacations were spent to breed
with elements like the um, <coughs> the uh, mafia with alliance with political parties and the land of the future the shaker. If these attacks could be placed in the context of the fact that they are essentially an attempt to defend um, the privileges and the um, the economic interests of those with power, who are finding that power is being threatened. Um, and perhaps that is really the difference with the fixies. I mean, obviously, when you grow up, you, you have a different perception as a child of what is poverty, what is poverty exists. But I think, um, in a historical perspective, it's very clear that what has changed since then is the fact that. Then the Hatma's extraordinary popularity was certainly helped by the fact that he was a man from the outside uh, who had no personal stake uh, in the local conflicts and whose legitimacy as a leader was to some extent enhanced by his external origin. But other men from outside the history had concerned themselves uh, with the indigo question, such as uh, Maheshwari Prasad, the editor of the Bihari uh, in 1912, or and Arya Samaj's Jamna in 1916. And their capacity of mobilization had never been even remotely comparable to that of Gandhi. Uh, yet no emissaries had been sent in advance to prepare for his coming, um, as was to be often the case later in similar circumstances. Rajendra Prasad later wrote, they had heard this much, that someone had arrived in the adjoining district of Mudafakur with a view to helping them. It is a matter of mystery to me how these people seem to develop the confidence that their deliverer had come. The outburst of popular enthusiasm generated by Gandhi has often been ascribed to uh, the force of uh, his charisma. Now, this the very notion is uh, an omnibus concept which defines a, a certain form of psychological and cultural relationship between the leader and the masses, but says nothing about his content, which in fact varies from case to case. It also seems to presuppose a sort of passive docility uh, on the part of the people, which is not really acceptable. And it leads the historian to uh, explain the leader's mass appeal in purely cultural, if not culturalist uh, terms. For instance, it has been uh, often said that the peasants saw Gandhi as uh, an Avatara or a Rishi, a Sanyasi, a Sant, a Muni, and so on. These stereotypes are undoubtedly more or less present in the uh, rumors which were afloat in the pictures for actions uh, that strung the popular mind. It might be more useful to try to explain the uh, immediate popularity of Gandhi by the nature of the collective anxieties and expectations which uh, he seemed to answer, uh, even then uh, from the obligation to grow the plant. Uh, with uh, these compensations uh, exactly from them, the riots uh, had been subjected by the planters uh, to yet another kind of abuse which uh, they did not know how to resist. They have always considered until then uh, rebellion against uh, the oppressive conduct of the landlords as uh, legitimate, as a legitimate form of uh, collective resistance, aimed at restoring the customary norm of justice and equity in the rural society uh, when it had been altered to an intolerable degree. Under colonial rule, however, uh, resistance was usually quelled by police and uh, judicial repression. Um, following the modern principle that the state holds the monopoly of legitimate violence. During the Champaran troubles of the 60s, the 1860s and 70s, the colonial courts had condemned all the rebellious peasants uh, they had caught as criminals. In 1908, the anti plunder agitation had been put down by police repression. Most riots in sequence had uh, yielded to the imposition of uh, Shaoreshi and Tawan, uh, in spite of the heaviness of the levies, because they could see no workable alternative. In fact, the uh, historical reality against which, uh, against which they had come up was nothing less than the expansion of colonial law and order and of the modern conception of state. 
Vihara, an experience which uh, Champaran and Vihara as a whole, uh, however isolated they may have been, uh, of course shared with the rest of the country. It, uh, in the colonial context, now that resistance by means of force uh, had become both illegitimate and efficient. In uh, <coughs> 1908, the uh, revolting peasants uh, had uh, uh, gone about in mobs and uh, broken the peace and were running and convicted. Um, now, with Gandhi, uh, they began to understand that boycott was a much more um, uh, efficient uh, weapon and less dangerous. Gandhi's methods, uh, in a way, restored the legitimacy of resistance in the colonial context and thus uh, revived in the minds of the writers the feeling that something at last could be done to rescue them from uh, oppression. Hence, the uh, instant enthusiasm which uh, greeted him on his arrival. Thus, uh, the Champaran movement, though outwardly a purely local event, was in fact connected with economic and uh, social and political factors of worldwide or countrywide dimensions. I have analyzed three such factors which uh, to me uh, seem to be particularly essential to the understanding of the uh, cause of the fall of the uh, I could summarize these uh, three points as follows. The, the first factor was the freezing of uh, agricultural development and change uh, by forced commodity production uh, for world capitalist for the world capitalist market, uh, which here took the shape of the superimposition of uh, an undercapitalized plantation economy on the small peasant sector. The second factor. Uh, was the defiant spirit and strong political capacities of the non-cultivating uh, high caste rural elite, which mainly uh, yeah, of the, uh, the fact that in Champara, uh, the uh, a specific uh, kind of social alliance was taking shape uh, between the uh, elite, uh, rural peasant elite, and uh, the urban middle class. And uh, what I feel uh, is that this alliance uh, has uh, been uh, consolidating all along the uh, last decades of the nationalist struggle, and that it is this alliance uh, which has uh, been in power uh, at uh, conquer, which has uh, conquered dominating position in the uh, Indian political system at that time, uh, and to some extent uh, is still... Mr. Sullivan, you would like to ask questions? Are you... I, I'm collecting, I'm collecting answers. Are there any to start? Uh, I think it's a fascinating paper that I noticed on uh, what happened in Chikmaran particularly fascinating. Uh, without getting into the trap of technological determinism, I wonder if the coincidence between the Chaban Satyagra and in fact the death of Indian motivation in Chaban incident, how much does that have to do with the invention of uh, uh, organic dyes by Francis is there some kind of a connection which could follow from that? Third is of course the fact that these mills also get into legal production, uh, which conflicts with the, with the prohibitionist policies of the Congress and particularly of Gandhi. So how did that uh, get reconciled? Uh, except that 
the planters were aware that uh, the future of uh, natural indigo was uh, very uh, uncertain because of that uh, new competition, which they were totally unable to, uh, to resist. And uh, <coughs> so this prompted the, the planters to uh, convert to uh, other kinds of uh, uh, production. And, uh, uh, but what they, uh, of course, wanted is, uh, was to uh, lose as little money as possible in the process. And so they tried to uh, have the, their tenants pay for the price of these uh, conversions. And that is the reason why they uh, levied these uh, uh, compensations, uh, which I've been uh, talking about, the Sharanishi and Tawan. And uh, uh, this, of course, was uh, one of the factors of the aggravation of the tensions and uh, of the outbreak of uh, 1970, uh, well, within their reach. And uh, that probably was uh, one of the major reasons for this uh, immediate popularity. Uh, just a minute. Uh, it's, uh, I think that we tend to think rather than methods, rather than the kind of political courage uh, that was. And in Indian discourse, this method sort of uh, overshadowed the, the, the political courage aspect of it. Oh, yes, sir. Obviously, this well, cannot be disassociated.
responsible to one of my favorite cities. Uh, Gandhi initiated a social movement in Jampara. He brought in Kasturba, he brought in other uh, associates from Maharashtra. But then the social movement almost fizzled out. In the aftermath, from the hint side, we can see that the movement had almost no impact on Japan. Why was it so? I'm not talking about peasants' movements. It is uh, absolutely certain that uh, there were peasants of all categories among the Uh, 
rules because the, the quality of their produce was uh, very uneven, while that of the uh, chemical uh, produce was, of course, uh, absolutely uh, stable. And uh, also because in terms of quantity, they were unable to increase their production uh, while uh, in the uh, uh, German uh, factories, uh, this was much easier. So, uh, but then it was too late to improve their methods and to invest because uh, uh, they had lost their market. But I think uh, if these uh, available technologies were not used or uh, were used to a very small extent, that was mainly because the economic option of the uh, planters was that, uh, well, their first priority was, was, was to keep their cost of production at the lowest level. <laughs> there was, uh, uh, after the Champaran movement, uh, Gandhi called in, into Champaran uh, uh, a few social workers from uh, his uh, 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 ashram in Gujarat and uh, uh, asking them to uh, uh, start uh, constructive work in the village of Champaran. Uh, a few schools were opened and uh, uh, some work was done in the field of sanitation and so on. But uh, <clears throat> what uh, Gandhi found, and he said this in his biography, uh, was that uh, this, the example uh, thus set in the village, given in the villages, uh, had not, was not followed, <coughs> but uh, actually many uh, villagers wanted uh, rather to get rid of those social workers because uh, they were uh, he says, uh, uh, well, disturbing. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, he said, we, uh, <coughs> friends from Gujarat, whom who I had called, uh, had uh, to go back. And uh, uh, so <coughs> this is uh, how it was. I mean, this uh, attempt at social work uh, did not, uh, uh, did not, did not really uh, work at that time. Um, and well, uh, Gandhi doesn't say much more about that, but uh, he seems to, to he hopes uh, that the, the small seeds that were sown at that time would uh, bear fruit sooner or later. Uh, but then uh, it seems that uh, the question that Surinder Gopal asks uh, is one that your first question, Ariane, to. Uh, reveals as a significant and long-lasting social consequence, which is Jacques' point about the symbolic meaning over the long term of what happened when he disaggregates the social categories of those people who were involved at all levels of what was happening in Champaran in the longer term as an alliance between the rural peasant elite and an urban middle class. And certainly the people that Gandhiji brought into Champaran uh, from Rajendra Prashad on up and down uh, can be described as, as an urban uh, middle class. I think the, uh, the uh, uh, symbolic meanings are very rich. The other point I think that Jacques' paper makes is uh, uh, one that has been repeated a number of times that bears repeating, which is <coughs> Gandhi was Gandhi, and Gandhi's role was a very complex one, uh, and gets read by us as academics in many different ways, just as it got read by the peasants and or also the middle class and the rank and file and the urban elite in different terms, which is a point I tried to make. Uh, uh, briefly yesterday, but the interest, especially interesting point about Jacques' paper, it seems to me, uh, is that in making the connection between the rural president of uh, the Sahajanan broke with Gandhiji precisely because it was uh, the uh, uh, urban middle class rural elite that Gandhiji referred Sahajanan to. See, my question is rather on the approach, you can even use paradigm, that whether we should
should use a global paradigm of class based poor and middle kind of thing on a movement like Chambara. In fact, this global approach of researchers to impose the same paradigm on almost all research analysis is creating a problem. I think there is a basic difference between the set of intellectual involvement in Champaran movement and in other present movements. In fact, you will see that large class of, which may not be so much of organic intellectuals in Kamshian sense, were always involved with Indigo movements kind, even in Bengal or here, which did not happen in later set of present movements. Now, my impression is, and in fact, uh, will be that this is because we don't really classify the movements or their reasons from their proper perspective. Before Chambara movement, there was another very important global phenomenon which happened under the colonial rule for the first time. The land ownership was open to outsiders from India. This was the beginning of plantation actually post Queen's rule, for the first time, European citizens, uh, they, they were farm land farmers rather than owners. I mean, they, they did not, uh, they were not proprietors of the land which they got in, but... Uh, they could not offer it in the earlier episode system. I will not go into details. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, I think that one, one thing which is very uh, specific, as you said, in Chamara and Mars, that in that particular context, these uh, uh, class enemy, so to say, uh, was at the same time the colonizer, uh, which is a situation which, uh, that's very true, does, did not occur in most present movements after that one. And I think, of course, this is a very No reaction. I mean, I fully agree what you just say. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the, for, for the question. Uh, I have important uh, uh, way of looking at uh, the global and the local. And we should have a little more discussion on this, about the use of different uh, paradigms in trying to understand the local and the global. Uh, I, for one, sharply differ from his position. I would like to express myself at some length at some point of time. If you can allow me later in the morning. I'll do my very best. <laughs> I assume all of you have got a copy of this paper circulated, which I have called Resistance and Rebellion in Contemporary Jihad Agrarian Landscape. Some reflections on the context, the actors and the scripts. Now, this paper is essentially so it is, is an attempt to understand basically the current phase of agrarian activism in Bihar and uh, it by and large shares the kind of analytical understanding which we find in the work of several scholars notably Dr. Bindas, Professor Hauser, among the among more recent contributions, Bela and Arpana, and several others. And in that sense, it's only adding my own voice to an already prevalent analytical understanding with some shifts in terms of emphasis here and there. I are very sort of brief introductions to the present phase. It is in the nature of some brief remarks prior to independence and uh, really sort of uh, what happened during the period of British rule or the colonial rule so that we sort of see the linkages. In the third section, I look at, or I rather give you some information which may be 
well known to most of you here, but it may be useful for some of those who are not very well versed with what exactly is happening in terms of the ground reality. And the current Arvind Das's 1982 and 87 work, Pradhan Prasad had a paper in EPW which is quite useful, a very fine document uh, which is called the <coughs> Report from the Flaming Fields of Bihar by Vinod Mishra in 1986. Arun Sinha's work, Against the Few, 1991. Among several other contributions, provide very good accounts and analysis of these ongoing movements which have become a force to reckon with. As Prasad reported, in May 1982 itself, the movement had become quite strong, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Bihar government had prepared a note on the extremist activities affected areas, which reported that almost 10.28% of the villages in Bihar, consisting of almost 8.23% uh, of population and almost 11.98% of the gross zone area were already affected uh, by the so-called communist extremist movement by May 1982. The more recent accounts suggest that the movement has progressed further in terms of its locational coverage as well as in terms of the deepening of the activism. Laborers and sharecroppers, somehow those never became the central issues. And in any case, soon after independence, the movement kind of quietened a bit for a variety of reasons including the expectations from and the faith in one's own government after independence, the sense of euphoria created by the enactment of agrarian reforms legislation, the limited success of land reform initiative in terms of some, some 20 million better off tenants gaining control over land, the major development initiatives by the state in terms of promoting a host of new schemes for agriculture, which accelerated the pace of transition to capitalism and generated a reasonable growth rate. In addition to the disintegration of Kisan Sabha during the 1940s, all these contributed to the quite to some of the 80s, Bihar's share in national aggregate fell from 4.4% to 3.4% in terms of the number of factories. So whatever may happen to the rest of uh, India, you know, to use to use the, 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 that uh, metaphor of the caged tiger being open and being uncaged, you know, to use the metaphor from the economist, Bihar certainly has become the goat in this process of liberalization to use, you know, a phrase that Arvind Das uses in one of his write-ups. In 1993-94, Bihar received just 1.2% of the total private sector investment in India. The ninth largest and the second most populous state in India houses almost 87% of its population in rural areas. In terms of occupational structure, the state has witnessed virtually structural retrogression as the percentage of total main workers in agriculture in total main workforce has increased from 73.33 to 78.83 between 1961 and 91 per caste without really abolishing zamindari. For instance, some of the biggest landowners in Masori block happen to be the Kurmis and Pali block happen to be Yadavs and Koheris respectively uh, and both these are in Patna district. As regards the lower layers of tenantry, Many of them were simply booted out, thus swelling the ranks of agricultural laborers. In terms of the determination of surplus and its takeover and distribution and tenancy reforms, Bihar's record has been dismal. In short, the so-called land reforms in the state affected the fortunes of the laborers and lower layers of the tenantry only in adverse ways, thus sharpening the divide between the landowners and them. Third, Apart from the land reforms, there have been other economic processes at work which have helped the sections of the upper backward castes consolidate their economic position. Now on this, not much work has been done, but my impression is, based on several micro studies, 
that there has been substantial shift of land away from the upper caste to uh, upper backward castes. Now, there are various underlying processes at work. You know, sort of the more visible ones would be, let's say, the children of, of the upper caste uh, families being sent to Delhi to become IS officer, the land was mortgaged. You know, the child does not become a bureaucrat, the land is lost. Had the child become a bureaucrat, you know, possibly the family would have bought 100 times more land than what it had to begin with, which had been mortgaged, maybe to uh, ongoing kind of economic consolidation of the backward class has facilitated the consolidation of the politic of, of their political power in Bihar as in most of Gangetic North India as uh, Professor Walter Hauser has mentioned in one of his JPS papers uh, and uh, uh, as has been also mentioned by Gould. Consolidation of the economic and political power of the upper backward caste landowners certainly does not mean the end of landlordism economically or otherwise. <coughs> Basically, it has resulted in the wiping of the social base of the exploiters. Even though the backward class landowners have historically displayed a marked preference for cultivation, compared to their compatriots among upper castes, which in fact is one of the important contributory factors behind their economic consolidation, they have increasingly come to adopt the path taken by the latter, the lower rung of which has increasingly been spread on account of the underlying processes referred to earlier, thus accentuating the already acute land hunger further, which goes on to accentuate the landlordism as such, partly because of you know, the reason that uh, Dr. Card Marx had mentioned in terms of high levels of brown rent contributing to the landlordism as a tendency, uh, which has been analyzed uh, by several scholar, scholars in India, for instance, who suffered by and so on. So in sum, we have a widening of the social base of landlords and certainly no abolition of landlordism. Fifth, the performance of agricultural sector in Bihar from the 1950s to the 1990s has been uneven both specially, specially and temporarily. But overall, it does not conform to a picture of stagnation. And this relates to some of the discussions which have taken place yesterday. In fact, the official statistics for the 1980s depict an impressive growth rate. Now, it is not my intention here to scrabble the numbers, but going by several field accounts, as I, as I say, the actors in the scripts. Uh, first point, you see, yesterday, uh, this Prabhat cover was distributed, which carried the news item that uh, center has finally agreed to the deployment of some 84 paramilitary uh, outfits in Bihar. And a fact which unfortunately had not been noticed, uh, noted by uh, the member of the police uh, service who was bemoaning the fact that, you know, these paramilitary forces are sort of very easily given to Punjab and Jammu and Kashmir and not to Bihar. And somehow he was linking it to the lack of uh, aggressive Bihari identity. Now, I think we should be happy that, you know, this has already been done. But the point is that those who wish to dismiss and condemn the present phase of agrarian radicalism, you know, uh, simply as escalated level of violence and counter-violence, and put the onus for all this on the struggling poor, essentially are articulating a class position. And that is something which sort of, I mean, I think to this gathering should be obvious. But this point was made very well by uh, Renal Sen once, which has been, you know, when he was uh, president of Indian People's Human Rights Tri Tribunal on Arbol Massacre, and uh, his point was uh, quoted by Walter Hauser in his JPS paper, which I quote here. Law and order do not exist in a vacuum. Both are the products of socio-economic factors. And for, the, for that simple reason, problems of law and order cannot be solved without taking into consideration the factors which generate them. Therefore, those who are suffering from the law and order syndrome should better remember that if socio-economic factors are not taken into consideration while solving law and order problems, the idea of law and order becomes a myth, and law versus order becomes a reality. A reality which cannot be destroyed by bayonets and bullets. Uh, I have come towards the end of my presentation with and I have just two, three brief remarks. One, uh, you know, this whole question of violence and, uh, you know, the claim, let's say, made by ML organizations being 
the representatives of the true representatives of people and so on. As I said, it, it of course is 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 a somewhat complicated uh, sort of uh, question. It is, and I, I, I do not wish to uh, be reductionist in saying that only the ML organizations are the true kind of representatives of you know sort of struggling poor and so on and so forth. But it is it is uh, it is my understanding that you know they sort of have emerged as as uh, the major advocates of the struggling poor, and uh, even though one requires a much more complex analysis of the agent organization and the people, so to say, you know, uh, nonetheless, the fact is that they do seem to be the sort of uh, best advocates as of, as of now. You know, Balgopal, uh, looking at the Andhra in the Telangana region, sort of uh, uh, in, a, in a recent uh, paper in EPW, September 97, says that uh, you know, all this makes for a much more complex picture than either the communist revolutionaries or the police would like to admit. The author of what is happening in Telangana is neither the people nor terrorism, but a particular political agent which has a complex relation with the people and their very real aspirations, and uses terror among other, other instruments as a means. Now, Balgopal's position is as applicable to the movement in Bihar. Similarly, as regards violence, you know, Balgopal says, quick solutions are in any case difficult and any attempt to justify contemporary acts of violence and terror by appealing to the very human craving for a shortcut to happiness is an irresponsible political attitude, though one prevalent widely in radical circles. Now it is, you know, I, I, I do subscribe to you know, a similar kind of understanding and it is with such an understanding that I view the above noted changes in CPIMS liberation position on violence as a positive one, where it says that, look, you know, I mean, it's not our business to sort of perpetrate terror, but yes, we will use violence defensively. That is something which I think is, you know, it should almost be, uh, uh, you know, anyone's fundamental right. Drama in Bihar seems promising in many ways to those who subscribe to a humanist, socialist vision. This is going to be a long struggle, of course, you know, now that there are 84 paramilitary uh, sort of uh, wings being deployed, one can, one can realize what is going to be the fate in the ensuing days. But here is a struggle which is deepened considerably, which is widened considerably, and I think, you know, it, it will be impossible for the state to crush it as, as, uh, as, as you know, it has become very much a sort of uh, part of people's, you know, the struggling towards aspirations. And, and, and given the shifts in strategies, tactics, etc., I think it would be very difficult to crush it. Thank you. Sorry for your uh, sorry for having taken a good time. Thanks for your patience. Thank you very much, uh, um, I, I think that the, uh, the, the paper provides very good bridge uh, between the historical uh, analysis in the, in the first paper and, and the subsequent uh, uh, papers. Uh, uh, related to the change in the agrarian structure as well as to the, the character of, of the, the movement among laborers and, and, and peasants and, and the representation of, uh, uh, of these uh, the, the peasants and, and laborers. Um, many of the questions that will relate to your paper will also certainly relate to, to Kalpana. So what I suggest we do now because of, uh, because of time is that we take uh, a few, uh, few questions more on uh, as elaboration and explanation, uh, then break for coffee, I suppose, uh, and then continue with Kalpana's paper, and, and, and after that have a, a discussion on, on both uh, both papers. Okay. Uh, good luck to about ten minutes for for a brief question, please. The factors uh, behind the rise of movement. Uh, <coughs> well, it seems to me that uh, there is two sort of uh, non-economic uh, factors. In Bihar's case in particular, uh, the extra economic coercion uh, for one and the post-1977 aspirations generated among the landless poor, particularly in relation to the 20-point economic program uh, I mean, propagated by Indira Gandhi, which, uh, which while threatening the landlords, 
in, in actual practice, there is nothing uh, to change the uh, land revenue. But it whetted the appetite of the agriculture, labor, uh, and poor. So that aspiration question and this extra economic question, where the Bihar is potentially, I believe, different uh, from some other states where, where uh, similar economic disparities uh, first thing. So this is one question uh, which I like uh, to be taken up and reach the paper. But there are some other points uh, which we can take up subsequently when we we'll discuss together. Before getting into the main body of the paper, yeah, 
Yeah, before I get into the main section of the paper, um, I'd just like to <coughs> make a very brief comment about um, something which I think is very much in all our minds at the moment, um, which is the um, horrific massacre of 61 women, children, and men belonging to low caste laboring families um, in Bathe village in Jahanabad. Um, as you are aware, this is the latest in a concerted campaign of terror by the landlord sponsor Ranveer Sena. And once again, it's brought tensions in central Bihar into national focus. Um, but, but as we are aware, um, the forces which underlie these kind of atrocities cannot simply be understood um, in the way that most of the media has portrayed them, either in terms of caste conflicts or even uh, local disputes over land. Um, I would argue that while the inextricably interrelated questions of land on the one hand and caste on the other are indeed at the root of the battle being waged in the plains of Bihar today, uh, what is at issue here is the very nature of power in the region. Today, ownership of land and other assets, caste dominance, political position, and control over the state apparatuses and their resources all intersect in a way which, as has been pointed out, is by no means unique to Bihar, but perhaps takes a particularly potent form in the state. And this system, um, again, as, as has been reiterated, is by no means a static one. Um, as I'm um, trying to suggest in this paper, for example, um, technological developments have had a major impact um, particularly on um, um, larger cultivators belonging to the intermediate caste or upper backward caste. Um, but the system has essentially proved able to incorporate these changes without go undergoing a dramatic transformation. And I'm going to argue that um, essentially what's happened is that successive groups have ultimately followed similar routes to economic, social, and political power. Um, now, by contrast to this, the movements of agricultural laborers and poor peasants in the region have challenged the very basis of the existing social formation. Firstly, they are attempting to transform the relations of production and agriculture, which still underpin the power of the dominant uh, landowners, even those for whom agriculture is no longer their main source of income. And secondly, um, they are confronting oppressive caste relations. Um, and at a level of society, that of basically Dalit agricultural laborers and their employers, where these caste relations are inseparable from caste, uh, class relations. And thirdly, um, there's the fact that in waging these struggles, such movements, particularly those which are today being led by the CPIML, are coming into direct conflict with that section of the big landowners who have a variety of connections, both political and criminal. And such corporations are widening the base of the movement to include the smaller pair, smaller cultivators, and others who are facing daily harassment by these, these networks. And lastly, there's the fact that the expression of the discussion by the rural poor is the electoral arena, um, where uh, the internal liberation campaigns and all the assembly seats are being passed, has been perceived as a new kind of threat to the hitherto essentially unchallenged political power of dominant landowners and mafias allied to them. And this is one of the things which partly accounts for the huge scale of the activity with firepower and retailer. Um, now there are two points which I'd like to make um, which came up in, in the discussion today um, and which I'd just like to say a little about in this context. One is the whole question of violence against women. Um, what I keep talking about uh, women, and we can see this um, in a whole series of, of rapes which have been part and parcel of the matter that we've been talking about, um, in Bakhani Tola, where, where Bella can, can give um, much, a much more detailed analysis, um, and again uh, in, in Bakhe, where um, a very large proportion of the victims who are women. Um, and on the other side, you have the whole question of well, what is women's involvement in the movement. Um, now, one aspect of 
put there as well that we should say is striking is the whole question of women as laborers. Because if you look at um, agricultural production in, in Central Bihar, women's labor is central to it. Um, what that means is, for example, um, the um, agricultural operation of, of course, um, rice transplanting, harvesting, these are ones in which women labor is perhaps most important. And these are the times when there's the highest demand for labor and when um, these operations have to be carried out within a very short period of time, all the more so because um, there's a very widespread use now of high variety. So there's a time limit. So these are the times when um, the agricultural labor movement is able to bargain, is able to go on strike. So basically, it's a case of the withdrawal of women's labor specifically. And the second aspect of uh, women's involvement is um, as has been pointed out by Praveen earlier, the shift to um, mass movements as, and mass um, campaigns as a major form of organizing by, um, by the ML movement, particularly um, the CPIML liberation. And there, women's participation has been extremely strong in, in occupying land, in, um, in repelling um, police attacks on villages when they come to arrest leaders and so on. Um, and women have always been the, both the older dominant classes and the more recently white ones. And as I think I tried to explain at the beginning, these are forms of oppression which are based on caste and gender as much as class. Um, and what we have seen is that um, despite the fact that they are still waiting the minimum, the minimum um, rate set by the Bihar government, wages have increased in response to demands made by laborers. Um, but what has the response of employers been to this? Well, um, I think essentially um, there have been a number of changes in day-to-day -day practices which reflect um, attempts to reduce the labor share of produce, for example, augmenting the size of bonds which um, laborers receive um, during harvest. Uh, or they employ the system of choosing the government. But more significantly, um, employers have responded by withdrawing from credit and tenancy relations with the laborers. Um, because uh, the large uh, peasants in this area are basically the main source of credit for agricultural laborers. Um, and this is not um, perhaps the classic semi feudal interlocking where um, a laborer is dependent on their particular employer for credit. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of collective relationship between the laborers of that village and, um, and the kisans of that village. Um, so the, uh, the peasants, essentially, the, the, the rich peasants are able to respond in a conscious and coordinated way by withdrawing um, both credit and, um, and also uh, land facilities. Um, and they're also uh, able to mobilize um, the smaller um, peasants with whom they have a whole series of relationships of, of dependence, which I won't go into. Questions uh, in, in this discussion? Uh, I know, uh, first of all, the Republic Partners, they could also uh, Uh, due to certain factors which have not been underlined 
by the photo. And then you need to be focused because unless it is done, you cannot understand why the heart is beating so fast, why it is going down the ladder.
we basically say that it has really sort of tended to uh, be in the groove of backwardness, has not really come out of it, and which then uh, we are linking to uh, the movement, the struggle, and so on. But maybe you know, in our, in our, in our, let me revive the okay. paper. Maybe we should uh, uh, take it up uh, more, more uh, it, at 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 uh, greater length. Uh, I, I think that in Kalpana's paper, there is a clear suggestion for, for the stagnation right. where you describe that where the surplus is generated, it goes into, into, into criminal politics, basically. Is that right? Do you see that as a... Yeah, I mean, I do think that is one, one of the major factors. I mean, I think, um, well, do you want to complete your mm -hmm. statement? Okay. No, and then, you see, what, what, what I'm saying, I mean, after all, we see a certain kind of pattern of agricultural growth. As I, as I said that it has been very uneven both in terms of time and in terms of space. So it's certain attempts are made but then it plateaus very fast which comes out very well from Kalpana micro studies. And then you know all those technological constraints and essentially the, the sort of the surplus generated in agriculture are going somewhere else. So but even the non the off farm developments are also not cost equal. Not happening. No, sort of, you know, uh, except uh, a few things which are not particularly healthy developments, there is very little of so-called, you know, uh, rural informal sector which has, which was visualized as the great development of the 80s by a whole lot of scholars on the all India scale. That has not happened in Bihar. So the nature of the state and various other facts. But it, I think it's, it's a large subject and one can't sort of discuss it in a very. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just like, um, I agree with, with actually what you just said, and I think that, um, I think the question of uneven regional development and, and the impact that that has had on Bihar, and the, I think Bihar does need to be placed in this context, that perhaps wasn't um, the agenda of what I was saying, but it's certainly a very important context for what's happening. Um, but I think, you know, I, I agree that I think that, um, one can't go to the opposite extreme and neglect what is happening at the micro level in terms of class relations. And I think that is something which yes, is happening in a lot of other states. I think a specific combination of factors has led to it being particularly virulent in Bihar. But one of the interesting things about working on Bihar is the insight it gives you to what is happening in a lot of other parts of the country. Um, and just to go on to um, um, Dr. Ghosh's Comments. Um, I think yes, there are uh, you know a whole range of, of reasons why there's this very unique movement in Bihar, um, and you know questions of which, which were also mentioned earlier of you know the extremes of um, extra economic coercion um, perhaps could be linked to to what Arvind called the development of people from below that become very much the um, the social and political culture of the state, which is succession of groups as strategies such as have um, taken on um, as they um, acquire and try to hold on to power of their kind. Um, I think also, um, you know, every movement has its own political dynamic and that has to be looked at in, in detail because um, um, I think one of the interesting things about the initial, very initial phases of the emergence of um, the ML movement in Portugal was that the very first uh, demands in inquiry period were actually centered on the demand for Haritha and Islam. And it's interesting that in Bihar you've seen a shift from uh, a kind of valid caste-based consciousness to a class-based consciousness. And in so many other cases you've seen the reverse thing going on. Um, so, certainly, like, particular configurations of class and class are very important in, and I think the exciting and positive thing is the way that movements here have, um, or certain sections of the movement have been able to channel that in, in a positive way, rather than in a divisive way. Um, by recognizing a whole range of things which are not normally seen as, as pure class issues, um, Caste repression and increasing media and very media as well. Um, I think the question of, of um, wages, well, 
journey that also had to be linked up to the fact that there is this Tajikia history of, of struggle because I think you know, that has been one of the main reasons why what little wage increases have been have done so. And I think also um, You know means that the greater productivity in that region was actually greater provocation for demanding uh, more wages and so on. Now I I, I uh, take your question very well and I think uh, sort of we have to go somewhat deeper into the differences in land ownership structure between these different regions, differences in caste structure, differences in uh, topography etc which uh, sort of give you differences in productivity and these are some of the things which we have, I mean at least I have not gone into any great detail in my paper but I think all these do influence the momentum of movement uh, 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 sort of uh, together. Uh, my only sort of minor uh, disagreement with you would be essentially how exactly do we formulate this notion of you know conditions being more favorable or less favorable. Uh, that's somewhat uh, problematic. I mean I'm, I'm not rejecting it off and I'm just saying that you know sort of I have to do more homework to uh, look, 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 uh, look into that. That, that, that aspect and uh, even though the script is very unclear, there is too much of fratricidal kind of uh, uh, violence going on and so on and so forth, but uh, I think uh, clarity has it, uh, sort of has tended to crystallize over the last two decades and uh, I attribute that clarity to CPIML liberation's efforts during 1970s and 80s. You know, I mean in terms of its strategies, in terms of the things that it has put on its agenda, after all, very easily we can identify three clear issues, land question, wage question, question of social dignity. Now, similarly, in terms of the strategy, I think a clarity is emerging, which uh, certainly is very welcome, which also explains the resilience of the movement. Otherwise, the movement possibly would have been crushed as it happened in many other parts of the country. Uh, so, 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 I mean, so-called naturalized movement. Um, I suppose, uh, one last point, uh, often we sort of tend to assume that the movement is only here, I mean I don't think that is really the case or that there have been no really changes in uh, uh, the, the world of the rural poor in Bihar. Now I think that, uh, uh, I mean after all, James Scott has a very good formulation, you know sort of uh, weapons of the weak and day-to-day uh, -day acts of resistance and so on and so forth. What we witness here is more visible kind of movement, sure enough. And also it has expanded locationally, right? sort of it is also spreading into some of the North Bihar districts. But in other parts of the state, we do have sort of a series of less visible day-to-day -day acts of rebellion. True enough, it does, it does not generate very significant economic or social gains images. But over a period of time, it does create that little elbow room, you know, in which you can maneuver which in turn contributes to the strengthening of the movement either there or elsewhere. You know, some of the changes which Kalpana mentions in her paper in terms of the social relationship between the landlord and the laborer in, 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 in central Bihar is uh, identical to what has happened in Punia, for instance. You know, I, I actually sort of have, I mean, I've gone in Punia, I've watched Punia very closely for almost 30 years now. And early 80s, you know, I could, I, I know, so there, there has been a sea change which has come about in this respect, which is not very different from what has happened in Central Bihar. So when we talk of movements, of course, we have to sort of you know think about it in a in a in a broader perspective. Thank you. I want to ask questions. Can be made about the movement. Probably that can be used. You need to respond to this. Do you? No, not really. Okay. There is a question in the, in the back, please.
Uh, I don't want to be out there tearing, but it will cut into your lunch if, uh, if you go on. So I let uh, two more questions and, and, and a quick response, then we go on to the next paper. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Towards the end of um, both, uh, both you and uh, both uh, you and Karin argued that there is an increase in landlords, there is an increase in the profitability uh, for, land, uh, for landlords to exact rents. And I wonder how this equates with uh, the fact that landlords at, at the uh, present moment are uh, discarding tenancy agreements with recalcitrant tenants. So how is uh, it profitable for them? I don't understand to, uh, to uh, continue exacting rents in the manner in which you describe in a context of growing unrest and in the context of, as you have just described, where uh, all of Portugal seems to be under uh, domination of Okay, let me quickly respond. You see, the point is that it is not the case that there is uh, rising profitability. You know, one is not making that point if you become a, if you turn into a landlord. The point is that you all, I mean, the profitability is only very high from landlordism given the context of the variant structure. And these Johnny's come lately, the upper backward castes, have joined the bandwagon of higher castes to become landlords. Even though uh, sort of, even if the way that they have chosen to come up, initially cultivation, self-cultivation and so on, but now they are economically well off enough to possibly state this claim that, look, I mean, you know, I am as good as you are, and there, there is a trade-off involved between, let's say, that small profitability decline by shifting to landlordism, maybe, and uh, uh, what, what you get in terms of social status, possibly. But then I think it's a very kind of, you have all kinds of uh, processes at work. It is not the case that this is the only process. On the other hand, I, as I mentioned earlier, you find the other kind of process also which strengthens accumulation at the lower ranks. And uh, in spite of the, it's something like, you know, what happened uh, east of LB, rise of, uh, you know, strengthening of serfdom, when uh, uh, sort of there is pressure on landlords. So I'm looking at, I think, maybe I need to make a, a clear distinction between um, um, rent extraction meaning through leasing of land and other forms of, um, of um, appropriating the service which are essentially rented, such as um, hiring out equipment and also the whole thing of, of political rent speaking of various forms. So how we use rent becomes quite important. And I think, um, yeah, where, where I was certainly, there was this, this withdrawal from from um, from allowing um, agricultural laborers access to small plots of land, which they could only afford through share property. And the landowners certainly, as, as you suggest, they, they said that, well, we, we won't be able to, um, you know, get the crop back at the end of it because people are, you know, resisting. So that's true, there has been that decline, but all these other forms of, of activities in, in parallel and have actually continued to run. We have to make a, a, a jump in the, uh, in the discussion. Uh, but first I'd like to, to thank the two speakers uh, for a very interesting paper. In the next paper is on, uh, on the intellectual property rights um, by Suan Sai from the Dean uh, campaign. Um, we have about three quarters of an hour, um, but we would like to talk for half of the time. Um, the, the total is three quarters of, of an hour, otherwise we get, we get very hungry. So, half, half an hour, then there's 15 minutes for discussion. Please. I have chosen to speak today about a series of international developments which have great import for a state like Bihar, but also for other states like Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, and the Northeast. Primarily states where there are communities basically relying very heavily on biological resources in their economies and in their livelihoods. Also, these are the same. These are the same states that have, I think, in their Adivasi communities, 
which makes them very prime players in today's conflict, or at least it makes them prime targets in today's conflict. I speak about the conflict that has arisen recently on the whole issue of biological resources, which are being targeted. I'm very sorry. I'm um, so as I said, the issue of intellectual property rights the issue of control over biological resources, and the whole question of the priority and, um, and role that has been allotted to indigenous knowledge are issues that are of great relevance to states with Adivasi communities and to states with rural, huge components of rural populations that rely on biological resources. Now having said that, I would like to deal with why biological resources what you understand commonly as biodiversity, have become such a central focus of international negotiations and why they are of very great relevance to us as against many other issues that have arisen in international negotiations like the GATT and WTO, like the Convention on Biological Diversity and others. The reason for that is that India's economy and very much the economy of states as I said, like Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Northeast India, maybe Kerala, is because of their reliance for livelihoods and economies on indigenous knowledge and on biological resources. For us, it has relevance today on our classical livelihood and, agriculture and, and uh, production methods and processes via agriculture. But there is immense potential for us because of the development of biotechnology. Biotechnology is slated to be the single most dominating technology of the next few decades and it will be north-south divide on the issue of biological resources and biotechnology. And the north-south divide has led to a situation where mostly technology rich countries, that means industrialized nations, do not have access in their backyards to biological resources on the one hand and those bioresource rich countries which have the biological resources but mostly do not have adequate technology standards in their own countries. One of the countries that does not fit into either group because of a series of fortuitous circumstances is India. India is a country where there is a large amount of biological resource base which is still preserved despite our deforestation. India also has another advantage and that is access to its immediate neighbors for biological resources. So the SARC and NAM, etc., the next two, would be in a position to participate, theoretically would be in a position to participate in a developmental and an economic model of growth that would allow them to retain control over their resources, provided we had intelligent policies. And that is precisely the point of Gene Campbell's work, is to generate the kind of awareness and try and formulate policy positions that will allow us to retain control over resources and that technology which means the indigenous knowledge. That is the reason why intellectual property rights are very important. Now what are the kinds of intellectual property rights that are in currency today? And what are the likely positions that we as a nation should think about? Primarily the whole question of intellectual property rights has arisen out of the GATT and the WTO in the, in the GATT trips for us to take a proactive stand in defining national legislation and national policy. Therefore, there is no such thing that is over and we can all go home and there's nothing more that can be done. There are three, as I said, primary areas of intellectual property rights pertaining to biological resources. This is number one, geographical indication. Number two, patent regime on microorganisms. And number three, a sui generis system for the protection of new plant varieties. All of this is there in, in the paper that you have. I won't go in necessarily into very many details. The geographical indication is the least discussed and is least known of the intellectual property rights issues of the trips. Geographical indication is a clause in the trip section that allows areas regions or countries to protect those products 
that are intrinsically linked to their region. This was initially introduced at the behest of Scotland and France to protect the champagne wine and to protect the Scotch whisky. This is because these are premium products. No other bottle of whiskey commands the kind of price that a Scotch bottle does. And Suntory of Japan has already gone into a conflict with the Scotch manufacturers of Scotland and, of course, lost. Similarly, the Italians with their Astis Pomanti wine, which is a sparkling wine, have attempted to call their wine Italian Champagne. The French region of France very successfully thwarted that. The reason is very simple. No other bottle of wine, no Astis Pomanti, can command the price that a bottle of uh, Chandon can. And therefore, they want the protection of this name. Where is the relevance for us? The relevance for us is in premium products like basmati rice and majjah. The geographically indicated rights of India have been violated by the United States, which is producing and marketing a rice called Texmati or Tex Basmati. It is as much a geographical violation as would be for Santori to sell their whiskey as Japanese scotch or the Italians to sell their Astis Pamanti as Italian champagne. And this word, the name Darjeeling tea, is a premium name. There's no other tea that will command that price. There's no other rice that will command that price. And because uh, Basmati is associated with the India-Pakistan region, <coughs> it was taken up by the Indians and Pakistanis. And the American claim of Texmati, Tex Basmati was challenged. They settled out of court, uh, but this is the kind of intellectual property rights that comes about for geograph geographically indicated products, and this is something that India would do well to protect uh, its interests in. There could be other products like the Alfonso mango and the Shahi tree of Italy. To be offensive to its public order and morality can indeed exclude this, ca this category from patentability. That means that if it were to be offensive to the order of public, that means the public order, law and order, public order, or the morality of a society, that society need not enforce the patent in that category. I think that if we should take a position that according to the various religions being practiced in our nation, in our country, and the ethical and moral sensibilities of our people, it would be objectionable to grant ownership via a patent, however limited to 14 or 20 years. It would be objectionable to grant a patent on any living form, on every, any living creature, because our, our, our order public or morality would be offended by acknowledging that ownership over life could belong to anybody other than God. This incidentally has been used with a great deal of success in Europe by the claims and the conscientious of objectors to the patent that was allotted on the Anko Mars. And the Greens successfully challenged this patent in Europe, the patent on the mouse, by using the clauses of auto public and morality. So there is already a precedence. These are not things that are going to be settled in one protective, protective of who? In the case of the sui generis system, there are two parties of interest. One is the breeder, because it is the breeder of a new variety that would demand a protection in the form of a plant breeder's right. That is what the sui generis system refers to. Our law, India's law on sui generis protection for plant varieties should accommodate the rights of the farmer, not only the rights of the breeder. This thinking is based on certain premises. One is that no new variety bred by any breeder is snatched out of the air. Every variety is based on breeding from older varieties. And therefore, the older varieties, which have mostly been bred by farmers, will have to be acknowledged as the source material in the development of any new variety. And therefore, the role of farmer as the contributor of genetic material as indeed also the role of the farmer as a breeder himself or herself. 
for Rajasthan. It is planted in over half <coughs> of the cotton growing regions of Rajasthan. It's one of the most successful varieties. <coughs> that is a farmer rupees. That is a farmer's variety. This is only to indicate that the farmer is not just a little hobby breeder that is applicable or effective in its village, but indeed the farmer is a breeder that has an impact on the release of new varieties and at the release of um, uh, crops. These are the three issues of intellectual property rights. Uh, these are the three issues of intellectual property rights <coughs> that are concerned with um, biological resources. We have finished drafting and I've been part of that expert committee that has drafted the farmers' rights uh, law, which means that our sui generis is called the Plant Variety Act and Farmers' Rights Act. There is also a provision in this act for the creation of a national green fund into which should flow those revenues or royalties that should accrue to farmers in payment of using their material, uh, in payment of using their knowledge. It is after all a scientist who goes to a farmer to ask what do you do, what do you grow in arid areas? And then out of those varieties that grow in arid areas, you trace the genetic material for new breeding stocks. So what do we do? These are the questions of intellectual property rights. India should have and has drafted a draft which, as I said, will definitely be converted. There are strong seed companies that would not like to see farmers' rights enacted in India's legislation, and they will undoubtedly use their political influence to make sure that before it reaches the cabinet or after it reaches the cabinet, kept uh, in, in the moonlight for three nights, has the property something. And I don't think that anybody else has a right to tell them what to do with it. So the role of indigenous knowledge must be given a very, very high priority. And I urge you all in your discussions, should you ever take up discussions on indigenous knowledge, to come to the view that you that you will uh, often hear in smart places like metropolitan cities of India, perhaps even in Patna, uh, that, oh, that knowledge is just all by sales. You know, unless we scientifically validate it, unless we experiment with it and document that that yellow flower can in fact cure diabetes, then we have no business promoting it. I would like to differ very, very strongly, and I think we in Jane Campaign hold a very strong view of this, that have been through a series of generations <coughs> conducted and that have held and produced a body of knowledge that has been filtered by as much scientific experience and validation as exists in this other form. Those, I think, are primarily the points that I wanted to raise with respect to the importance of intellectual property rights for us as a people, but very particularly for those communities that are rural farming communities and that are Adivasi communities. Thank you. One question, which is uh, of, of clarification, is where do you see uh, the risk coming from for these uh, communities that, that make use of, of, of natural resources. I mean, the, I, I, I understand the point of that, you know, we need to recognize the validity of, of you know, different forms, uh, even if it isn't tested in, uh, uh, in, in at the lab. But, but where, do you see any risks for the, for the use of this, and, and where do they come from? I think primarily it is misappropriation of knowledge and resources. For example, if uh, an Indian or a foreign company were to commercialize products based on the resource and knowledge base of communities, then that should happen within a framework which shares the benefits, the profits that accrue from that with those communities. And therefore, the proposal of a community or a national gene fund, that is not happening. And commercialization, the first option of commercialization should be given to communities. And it is not I or you who come as a, as much an Indian company as a foreign company and say, thanks a lot, I'll take that. I think communities have a right to say, no, thanks, you won't. Because we intend to get into herbal products ourselves. So I think the danger comes from that. Can I see how many questions there are?
in the country there is already a big question, which community? And this debate has reached uh, quite a high. I think that should be introduced because it can be at the national level, it can be at the state level, it can be state bureaucrats who are taking, and the community is also a big concept. And that debate has already reached a height in the country. Third and foremost question, GATT and the WTO regime in the world is basically globalization as a controlling power. And it has another tendency to reduce the global decision making at the top level. The current efforts are that this is being disputed only at the national level. And whoever can join in the debate has to be in the national scene. Since it is a seminar in Bihar where you have come to participate, I would like you to think aloud. What do you think a state like Bihar, even in the communities of Bihar, or we just can't be anywhere in this debate. A state like Bihar, or institutions in Bihar, can participate in this debate. Where do their voices come? And where they do come in this debate? I think this is the greatest danger that WTO is the component to this as well, except to say one thing, that as much as the rural communities are inheritors of the Ayurvedic tradition, so would Indian communities of other kinds, also urban, have the right to claim a certain percentage. And therefore, I wouldn't exactly place on par what text of Baya does with what Dabur does. But I stand by what I said, that Dabur must be made to pay royalty, perhaps a little less royalty than uh, Hux to buyer, but must also be made to pay. The question that came from here about dilution of legislation. There are vested interests that have a position on whether farmers should have rights or only breeders should have rights. People like Jean Campbell, and I'm sure most of them represented here, would have the right that farmers' rights should, should we have a position that farmers' rights should be strengthened. International seed companies, and to some extent Indian seed companies also, would not want a strong farmers' rights because strong farmers' rights gives the, the farmer the right also as a seed producer, which means Despite the protection of a breeder's right, the farmer will retain, as we have included in this draft, the retain the right to sell seed without commercial branding arrangements and selling seed. So obviously, the seed industry would not want strong farmers' rights. I don't think that it would be very much in favor, the corporate sector generally would be very much in favor of strong protective rights like compulsory licensing, licenses of right, which means that in an emergency, you have the right to compulsorily give production of seed into other hands. This is a very, is a very real fear that farm control and production The state has to take responsibility for making available that little known bajra that only grows in Lahore Spiti, for making available that salt resistant paddy that will grow in coastal Andhra with inundation of 30 days in a year. The provision of sea generous legislation, the other way come in the biodiversity legislation. To come to the third person who uh, Ask the questions. I wanted to come back to the biodiversity draft legislation, which also we have now finished drafting before the government fell. The biodiversity draft legislation is also a very strong legislation, a very strong draft act with strong rights for communities and a national fund, as much as in the sui generis legislation and also in the biodiversity legislation. There is the provision of a national fund. I'm completely in agreement with you that communities is a concept that is potential trouble in the sense that if you acknowledge the rights of a geographically located community, acknowledging the rights of communities in commercial production, this is the first time it's being done. 
and there is nobody here who claims to be such a repository of knowledge as to get it right the first time. I believe strongly that we will get into legal disputes, that there will be litigation, and that our fund of experience and knowledge will derive from case law. And that, I think, is a perfectly valid way to go. So that would be a model that could be left as a, a functional model for a national gene fund which communities can access. As I said, say for example, the communities in Wainar would have a greater access than uh, the sugar growers of Maharashtra. I mean, these kind of obvious distinctions exist. And these demands can be articulated very strongly from those states, like from the Northeast, like from Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, Trust of Kerala, where communities have actually demonstrated. One of these evidences of demonstration is the study that we have done, but there will be others, have demonstrated the strength of indigenous knowledge and its validity to the international drug and herbal industry today. So that is one of the things that can be done at the informal, when I say non-governmental level. At the governmental level, I think uh, there should be pressure that states should demand the right to control access through national and state level authorities. One of the things that we have suggested in the biodiversity legislation is that na there should be a national authority to regulate policy on biological resources and not some ministry or the other. This has made me the enemy of the environment ministry forever and beyond, but uh, the national level authorities should have, and one very significant thing that we have managed to get onto that authority, which was certainly the target of dilution, on the biodiversity legislation, not the Sujavis legislation, that on the national authority in Delhi of 11 members, there should be direct representatives of Adivasi and rural community. That means a farming woman or man and a Adivasi and, in this case, Adivasi, Adivasi man or woman, at least, will sit in Delhi. This led to a few was again very representative. But this is the, these are the kinds of demands that should come from uh, those states that are actually owners of large tracts of forests and home to many of the Adivasi and uh, rural communities. One last question that you raised about how much, how much of it was Gene Campaign's view and how much of it was in the draft. There is much of what our view is that is in the draft, thankfully, which will also be diluted, unfortunately. But there is much more that cannot come into draft. People would like to take responsibility for keeping us from our time. Just one small thing. <laughs> now, uh, essentially two things small. One, uh, this whole business of uh, assigning property rights that could be the basis for is definitely an extremely messy thing and of course it's linked with you know a variety of other things, like the whole business of class, you know all kinds of things. And to that extent, I completely agree with Professor Nimitz and Gupta when he says that, you know, in community, this notion of community is a very slippery notion. And, you know, I don't know in, in, in when, when, when you start implementing these things, how messy the, the whole outcome could be. But that is something which is not the main point which I want to make here. The main point is that, you know, I have often been uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, intrigued by the fact that something which is, uh, those who are familiar with economic theory, for them, very much part of the folklore that, look, patents are a bad thing, you know. From the point of, point of view of standard neoclassical economic theory, you know, sort of anything which comes in the way of perfect competition or free competition is something which is bad. And in fact, the first strong defense of, you know, patents came from Joseph Eloy Schumpeter in his book Capital, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy. We were saying that, look, in the short run it does uh, provide some kind of incentive to the certain categories of producers and hence there should be patents and so on. To my mind that has always been a very weak defense and what intrigues me is that why is it that we don't see strong movements which simply say that no patents, you know. Uh, for instance, you know, in practice, one can go back to, let's say, what Soviet Union did regarding books. I like your book, I'll simply produce it. You know, I'm sort of managed to do that. You know, 
I mean, sort of, why is it that movements are not along those trajectories? Of course, one can always say that, look, you are being very fully headed. It's something which is not feasible. And hence, you know, since the first best is not possible, hence the second best. If that is the response, I understand it. On the other hand, I cannot understand the lack of movements along the first line. Thank you. The industrial sector for which it was actually invented as an instrument is a completely different thing to patenting in the field of biological resources. That is one point that needs to be very clearly understood because the parameters are still for patentability in the industrial sector, but it is there's a complete mismatch with the biological sector. But I think that the main thing that has to be said with respect to biological material and indigenous knowledge is that this is community held knowledge which must not be privatized. The discussion we had on the uh, earlier uh, part of the session. I'd also like to thank the other three uh, paper uh, presenters. <coughs> and, uh, by the upsurge of Asian nationalism, and I could read occasionally uh, parliamentary speeches of Jawaharlal Nehru, which appeared in Japanese journals. However, there was dearth of literature on contemporary India. In, the, in, the, in my university, I learned na nothing about contemporary India and Hindi language, which most of you speak. I learned this almost for myself, and my Indian studies started or was forced to start from how to be interpret Japanese studies on India that were done in the 1930s and in the critical war years. So I came to know the name of Swami Sahajana not from Professor Hauser's excellent work but from an imperialist historian to Prat's work on Indian constitutional problems, which thought Sahajana unconstitutional. <laughs> from the end of December 1941 to June 1942, two rival organizations of students and peasants held their annual sessions in Bihar. All India Students Federations, the so-called Shah Group, had their conference in Patna in December 1941. <coughs> uh, Anugrah Narayan Singh uh, inaugurated. Soon, the All India Students Conference, so-called Faruqi Group, was also held in Patna from December 1941 to January 1942. And Mian Iftikaru Team, President, Punjab Provincial Congress Committee presided. In May 1942, six uh, sessions of the All India Kisan Sabha was held at Bita. All India Kisan Conference, which also claimed to have inherited Kisan Sabha movement, led its <coughs> six session uh, at Bedor Muzaffar district from 6 to 7 June 1942. The selection of timing and Bihar as a place for these sessions was not accidental. The disintegration of the left unity in 1940 <coughs> led to the rivalry, uh, rivalry for the hegemony in the mass organization among the left forces, particularly between the Congress Socialists and the Communists. The start of the Russo Japanese War in June 1941 made their split undecoverable because of the difference of their interpretation of the character of the Second World War. It needed about six months 
This is a Japanese proverb, which means that even if Bushi, samurai warrior, did not take food, he uses his tooth stick as if he took enough. Generally speaking, this is not true in the real history. In the first half of 1945, more than 2 million people died in North Vietnam due to the man-made or war-made famine. It was caused by the, Japanese, by the Japanese food procurement for the army, and the shifting of crops for the military purpose, and the disruption of transportation during the war. The Bengal famine of 1943 was also caused by various factors like the fall of Burma into Japanese hands, denial of policy, military priority in food supply, Japanese bombing, and so on. British in India was more concerned with the food for their own army than for the Indian people. The food department appeared only in December 1942. Uh, 1942. It was according to the general rule of the war that the Japanese army uh, tried to procure food for their own needs from the areas of Asia where they occupied. The way of procurement in the occupied area was far from winning the support of the people for the conduct of the war. Louis Fisher once wrote in his book on the Second World War, uh, India's politics are made in the stomach. What Louis Fisher failed to notice was the fact that this hunger was caused not only by the colonial rule, but also by the war. Indian villagers, Indian villagers made their image of the world war uh, through their consciousness of the hunger. Main themes of the all India sessions of student and peasant organization was the freedom of India, the demand of Pakistan, Russia's participation in the war, and the imminent Japanese aggression. Particularly in the student conference of the Faruqi group, the general atmosphere at the conference that the Indian nation uh, newspaper, the Indian Nation Express, was one of support to war efforts. The main slogan was Soviet war, people's war, people's war, our war. On the occasion of the peasant conference held in May and June 1942, Sahajanat group urged the sale of grains through cooperative society, fixation of minimum prices and wages, besides the preparation against the aggression. Also, in the Bedouin conference, Acharya Narendra Dev President advised the intensification of global food campaign and cooperative spirit among the Kisans, and asked the Kisans to follow the Congress program of self-defense and self-sufficiency. And it was also in the editorial of 20 December 1942 that the People's War Communist Organ called for the formation of People's Food Committees in every town and villages bringing about the cooperation between merchants and people's organizations in localities, ensuring the unity of all sections and communities. Already in October this year, the news of starvation and the looting of rice began to be heard from Mohammed Singh, Faridpur, and other areas of Bengal. Though the political parties and mass organizations have a food problem as a part of their programs, it seems they could not anticipate it its serious character in advance. As Dr. Henningham pointed out, administrative reports on Bihar continued to note the increase of crimes due to rising prices and the shortage of foodstuffs and other daily goods in the first half of 1942. Raflo Sankrit Yam who was released from jail on 23rd July 1942, noticed this discontent of the people in the act of Riksha Ika Charanewale, uh, Riksha and Force Care Plus, in Patna on 12th and... Hunger to the Second World War, or to the, I mean, I really, because you suppose that they, that it was an anti-war struggle, but do you have any kind of 
um, in, I mean, uh, proof that people have believed and uh, formulated uh, and their, uh, the causes of their poverty and the film to the second world war. That I wonder, that's one question. And the second question is, uh, do you have any idea how the situation was in Ranchi? Because in Ranchi was a big station, a uh, war. Um, um, uh, um, I, mean, I know there's a big cemetery actually, and I seem to have died a lot of people in the Second World in Ranchi. Do, so, do we have any data uh, of that? I think what uh, Katinka was asking was number one, that have you got... Thank you. 
that really, it was just kind of real happening, uh, not just at the level of the Congress leadership, uh, uh, but clearly inspired by the Congress leadership, it spread in, and, and, was, and manifested itself in terms of mass withdrawals from banks and, uh, and so on. I think uh, the, it's often underestimated the, the fact that this, uh, when he launched in August 1942, that it, it was very clear to them that uh, uh, the British were on the way out and the, and the Japanese would overrun India any moment. I think that's the context of, 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 of the military. Uh, struggle for food was not this only economic struggle. Uh, just uh, as in Bihar, that was also Ijat ki ladai. Hmm. That was my first question. I have two documents that I have seen. Three-four documents are very important. Three-four documents that I have seen. In Munger, there is a meeting where there is a police थाने जगह रिपोर्ट हो रहा है उसमें लिखता है कि जापानी लोगों के जो वार था उधर वार उसे समर्थन में लोग कर रहा है हवाई जहाज जा रहा है तो लोग खुश हो रहा है कि जापानी जा रहे हैं हमको लिब्रेट कर देंगे आप सोच रहे हैं कि किस तरह का सेंटीमेंट लिया था पॉलिटिकल सेंटीमेंट और लोगों के प तो उस पीरियड में मैंने बहुत ही नीचे लेवल पर जाकर के थाना से जो रिपोर्ट आई है एसपी और जिला के स्तर पर जो रिपोर्ट पड़ी हुई है उसको मैंने देखा है और उसमें ये सारी बातें लिखी हुई हैं तो उस समय ये तांगा वाले का थाना एक फल वाले का उसका हो जाना सजा दिया तो और इस तरह से किसानों का करना बहुत मैंने लगता है कि ब्रिटिशर तो हमारी लिख रहे थे या पुलिस रिपोर्ट कर रही थी तो जान तो नहीं कर रहे थे जान रहे थे कि क्या है समझ लो था Actually, there were no real starvation deaths recorded in what we found in, in, uh, in Bihar. So quite clearly, the effects of uh, uh, the reduction in, in rice imports from Burma as a result of the overrunning of uh, the Irrawaddy by the Delta by, by the Japanese forces did have its impact in, in acute scarcity conditions prevailing. But the similar kinds of conditions that happened in Bengal did happen in Bihar. No scare, no clearly the pinch was felt. But it wasn't really, it didn't manifest itself in famine deaths as well. It, 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 it was not officially recorded. Any other questions? Comments? If there aren't any, I think we make a very good time. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Kovacima for the uh, insight into how the Japanese angle traded over here. In and perception on or understanding India's interests. Thank you very much. We are keeping good time. Um, I'll now ask Sri Neeraj Kumar to speak. Yeah. And, uh, <coughs> it, it has grown out of um, a filling in of a historiographical gap about the Pakistan movement because in the last decade or so uh, there have been some uh, regional studies on the Pakistan movement in Bengal, Punjab and Sindh but not on Bihar and uh, I was trying to put together the Akaliyat perspective of the experience of the partition that is um, the feeling among Biharis who stayed back or even debated about the Pakistan movement or, and among the Aryas who left uh, India and moved to either Dhaka or Karachi that uh, during the Pakistan movement it was uh, the Biharis who were sacrificed three times over once in 46, then in 47, then again in 71. So uh, I have been uh, looking at partitions twice and thrice migrants in that sense. And uh, looking at the discourse uh, that has come out of uh, the 66 refugee camps, 
within Bangladesh since 1971, where a lot of Biharis have been uh, living and uh, waiting for repatriation to Pakistan. In fact, the, the last uh, journal that I got out of the camps was uh, a trilingual journal in which uh, the Biharis have been describing themselves as stranded Pakistanis, Mesur Pakistanis, and Artke Pora Pakistanis. You know, people who just, uh, they've just been left behind. And so they've been trying to re-invoke the uh, Lahore Resolution of 1940 and argue that um, Jinnah was able to clinch his demand for Pakistan only after the horrible dimensions of the 1946 riot in which about 30,000 Muslims were killed in Patna and uh, Munger. And uh, yet nothing has been done by uh, successive governments in Pakistan to get these people across to uh, Karachi. But then they've come, uh, come up against uh, opposition from various Sindhi movements. And if you were to look up the home page of the World Sindhi Congress, you get um, quite a bit on what the Biharis are like and how they should be kept out of Pakistan. And even if uh, you know uh, they were to uh, be uh, repatriated to Pakistan and landed in uh, Punjab, they would ultimately move to Sindh, and that would sort of uh, complicate the ethnic problem there all more. So they have uh, uh, this Bihari local movement in different forms that have been going on. The other uh, site that I looked at and uh, discourse that I looked at was that of the MQM, the Mahajir Kami movement, and. Uh, the pressure that they've been facing from Bihari families to prioritize the repatriation of the Biharis from Bangladesh. And um, there is a lot of talk uh, in Pakistan about the fact that ye Bihari join Dhaka Hukar, the other ones are creating all the chaos in Pakistan, in the MQM and, and stuff like that. And uh, there is also this feeling that uh, Bihar was a but, an ex button but not quite an ex button because in 1971 a lot of people came to Bihar, made Bihar the temporary uh, home yet again and then moved to Kathmandu and then Sri Lanka, Thailand and then went on to Karachi. So I've been looking at uh, uh, Bihari bonds during that uh, period 1970-71 and how uh, the Bihari diaspora in UK intervened uh, through the Asian Refugee Council to um, get at least some people across from uh, Dhaka to Karachi or get just uh, liaised with people like Ghulam Sarwar and uh, the Bihari Bachao Manch and pleaded with the government that Bihari should be allowed to come back home because, uh, you know, they have nowhere to go to. Uh, also, what's very interesting is the way in which Bihar has been described in the letters of the Stranded Pakistani General Repatriation Committee in Dhaka, uh, which is uh, really an organization of the railway optis from Bihar. And uh, <coughs> Bihar is retrospectively looked at and presented, uh, represented as that rich province which we left simply because we were uh, answering Jinnah's call. And we, we really didn't know that we'd lose our citizenship if we moved to Pakistan and opted for uh, service in Pakistan. So that's uh, one thing that I've been looking at. And uh, subsequently, I've been looking at the uh, continuing and different resonations of the denomination <coughs> national meetings of the 1940s in the South Asian diasporic formations in UK, USA and Canada. You know, this feeling uh, that Biharis have suffered the most and they, they're not get, uh, getting a sunwai uh, from either the governments in Pakistan or uh, the Bangladeshi governments. And uh, there have been attempts by some Biharis in Atlanta to float the Atlanta Bihari connection to get together Biharis who left Bihar uh, before, uh, I mean between 47 and 71 and even after that. But uh, the Muhajis have been a bit, uh, ex Muhajis as they call themselves now, um, feel that that's an identity that they may not like to go back to really. You know, but uh, then uh, it's justified along the ground that in North America you have the Hyderabadi Muslim and the uh, North Indians 
being very active and keeping to themselves, and so the Bihari should give the lead in trying to put together an organization which transcends the politics of uh, the partition and you know, the fallout of that kind of nation making. Uh, I've also been looking at uh, the BHP in uh, North America and the extent to which it, it has been alerted by the Forum of Indian Leftists uh, when, for example, it goes online or gets in touch with AT&T and uh, makes an arrangement uh, for uh, income tax-free deductions to finance uh, uh, the movement. And there is uh, a need to look at the Ranveer Sena at one end of the spectrum and uh, this kind of activity by the, uh, the, the BHP ensemble uh, 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 overseas as well. When I was looking at uh, the American Federation of Muslims from India, what I found was that uh, they did try and get together with the international Dalit Sena and the Janta Dal in the uh, post Babri Masjid context. But most people who are involved with that organization, which holds uh, conventions in uh, various Indian cities by rotation, as the last one was held in Patna in, in December 1996, uh, they don't seem to take uh, into consideration uh, the <coughs> movements that have been going on among the uh, laboring biradaris within the putative Muslim community. And uh, in fact, some of them said that they didn't know anything about it. But uh, when I uh, kept at it, uh, the, uh, it was revealed to me that yes, the All India Muslim Backward <coughs> Resolution copy was given to us when we were at Patna. So yes, maybe something is happening, but we really don't know much about it. Uh, the OBC movement within the uh, Muslim community is something uh, which started in the mid-80s uh, when the Mormons were in the forefront of uh, getting themselves out from Annex to 2 to 1. And then uh, the Sabzi Farooq, that is the Rains, they joined in. Uh, so I've been looking at a couple of these uh, mobilizations among uh, the Mansoors, the Dunyas, and the Qureshis and the Kalals, and um, subsequently at the All India Backward Muslim Morcha, which has been launched by Rajaz Ali in 94 in Patna, uh, to give Dalit Muslim status to 20% of the Muslims who don't fall into the backward class category. And the, the uh, statistics with which he's working is um, as follows that there are 70 percent Muslims in Bihar who are backward, 20 percent who are Dalit Muslims, and so uh, Article 341 should be amended so that they can be given Dalit Muslim status, and uh, therefore 22.5 percent reservation in government jobs and in educational institutions. But um, what is to be uh, taken note of is that neither the Athmi nor the CPI ML and uh, the Muslim organize, uh, the organization called the uh, Inkalabi Muslim Conference, which has come up in uh, 1992 September, uh, really have come to terms with uh, this development. In uh, in sense that the older leadership, whether it's the Bharatiya Sharia's leadership of the Composite National Nationalism 